Hello, uh, welcome back, uh, my friend and friend of uh, Mulenge Speaks uh, series. Today uh, we are continuing with our expose and uh, we will touch the subject of uh, Pierre Mulele Rebellion. Uh, we saw, uh, we have been talking about Mulenge, we have been presenting Mulenge, and Mulenge have been uh, speaking out against the uh, Banya Rwanda. Uh, of uh, Tusi social status or social group that are living in uh, Eastern Congo or Eastern Democratic of Congo, uh, especially in the uh, uh, province of South Kivu, in particular in the zone of uh, Uvira, Fizi and uh, Mwenga. And so today we're gonna touch that subject because uh, it was brought up by uh, uh, the Banyarwanda, uh, particularly when uh, Dr. Kaniki was pr making his presentation at uh, the uh, invitation or hosting by uh, Pastor uh, Scott uh, City of, <coughs> of the New Hope Free Methodist Church that is uh, located in Rochester, New York, here in the uh, United States. Uh, the reason being that uh, uh, in the previous uh, video, in uh, video or part 21, A, B, and C, we talked about uh, the Mobutu syndrome. Uh, the Mobutu syndrome, we say that was uh, this uh, story, uh, this propaganda that is going around that uh, Mobutu was, uh, is still uh, accused of being uh, the center of the problem that the, most of the Banyarwanda are facing today in the uh, DRC. Uh, because he signed those laws, the laws of the decree laws of 1971 and 1972, uh, granting uh, a mass uh, the Zairean nationality to the people of uh, Banyarwanda descent or the national of Rwanda or Rundi who arrived in Congo uh, before 1950. And then also uh, uh, later, he, uh, the law where <coughs> The, the law were uh, broken or were taken out, uh, dismissed in uh, 1981. But we know from our research and what we presented before you uh, here on this platform, we said that uh, Mobutu was helping them because uh, uh, the national of Rwanda Rundi were left out uh, during the um, uh, round table uh, that took place in January and February. Uh, 1960 in Brussels, uh, Belgium, and also the general election, the first general election before the independence of the Congo in, in May uh, 1959, also left them out. And also the, uh, when the, the constitution, the first constitution were written uh, in August or promulgated in August 1964, the Banyarwanda or the population or nation of Rwanda or Rundi were also again left out. And so with the, uh, the help of uh, Bisengimana Rwema, who was uh, uh, the chief of staff of Mobutu, uh, convinced him that uh, we need to help this Banyarwanda who have come to this country. And they have been uh, contributing to the economy of this country. And so we need to help them, make them part of the Congolese society. And so that was the purpose, based on the information and the, the uh, books and writing that we have in our possession. That was the purpose of those two laws. 1971 and 1972. So we settled that matters. Then in uh, their presentation before the world through the social media, Dr. Kaniki with uh, his associate, they are invited by uh, uh, Pastor Scott Sittig, uh, and then they present the case that uh, uh, the Banyarwanda, now they are um, uh, taking up the, uh, the identity of Mulenge uh, everywhere they go. Now they are claiming that even the Mulele, Pierre Mulele rebellion that took place between uh, 1964 to 1968, it was between them, the cattle keepers and the agricultural people or the farmers, namely here the indigenous a uh, tribe of uh, Bavira, Bafulero, Babembe, Barega, and Banyitu. 
But we know from the history that that's not true. That's a lie. And then because we cannot stay quiet, we have to explain that too for the purpose of this uh, subject, Mulenge Speaks. And so today we are we're going to touch this subject and they will call uh, to the stand two witnesses. One will be exactly, uh, in fact, will be this uh, uh, Dr. Kaniki, who participated in this uh, presentation uh, hosted by uh, Dr. Uh, I mean, uh, Reverend Pastor Sitik. Uh, and I believe that the congregation, the member of that church, uh, followed very well with attention that uh, video, that presentation, and uh, people around the world have been was watching that video and they believe what they heard. But there is also another side of the story, and that's what we'll try also to bring up here and try to defend Mulenge or defend what it is not told in that story. And also we'll touch as we go maybe in part B or C of this uh, uh, Pierre Mulele rebellion, we'll try also to bring up another witness. Uh, this time we'll take him from uh, uh, United uh, Nation, uh, United Nations, a lawyer who was an envoy to uh, uh, then Zaire to go and investigate possible uh, <coughs> violation of uh, human rights in that country in 1995 and 1996. But for now, let us see what uh, Dr. Kaniki said on that platform uh, when he was uh, hosted by Pastor uh, Scott Sittig of the New Hope Free Methodist Church uh, situated or located in Rochester, New York. And so uh, our brother here, uh, Dr. Uh, Kaniki said, so because of that livestock, people move from area to area. You understand at that moment, there were no country in Africa. There were just different kingdom in different areas. He continues that uh, by the time Africa was divided in countries, the Banyamulenge were in Congo. It is well documented in many books of Belgian books or in other books to independence prior or during colonization. So when the Congo was under the Belgium colony, the Banyamulenge were part of many tribes in Eastern Congo or in the entire Congo. Toward the end, during independence, Congo went through some civil unrest and they were split between the neighboring tribes that went to rebel groups and Banyamulenge sided with the government. So we'll stop from there and then we'll try to explain this small part here because it covers a lot and there are a lot of lies and that we need to bring up and debunk them because we don't want you who listen to them that particular day that believe that the rebellion that took place it was caused by the conflict between the cattle keepers who are who were and who are in these circumstances the Banyawanda and the farmers uh, or indigenous tribe the Bavira, the Bafulero, the Rega and the Babembe. So let us uh, break down this uh, uh, paragraph and see what it is true what is true and what is not true because we don't want you to be confused we know that we are all uh, for the social justice we want every person on earth to be treated equally we want all the citizens of any country to be treated equally and that they are all equal before the law but when we are presenting your case you have to say the truth you have to tell the truth and uh, nothing but the truth and we know, thank God that he mentioned it, that uh, everything was is documented. And we'll show here that we still have those documents about the rebellion at the State Department of this country, the United States. We have this uh, story in many books that were written. At the UN, we have those stories. When Lumumba came to the United States in uh, July, um, 1960. The documents are there. 
when he was assassinated in 19, 1961. The documents are there. When Pierre Moulele started the insurgency in Quilu, the documents are there. And Pierre Moulele was not from East, where the Banyarwanda and other tribes were living. He was from the West. So how the rebellion that started in the West end up in the East is what Dr. Kanik did not tell you. And that's what we'll try to say here. We we'll try to present to you here. So let us break, as I'm saying, this uh, paragraph. The first thing that he said, he says, there were no country in Africa. There were just different kingdoms in different areas. So my viewers, this is what he says, that before 1885, before the division of Africa into countries, there were no countries, but there were kingdoms. But we know that a kingdom is a country. A kingdom is a state. For example, in the year 927, there exists the kingdom of England. In the year 1707, this kingdom of England united with Scotland to form the kingdom of Great Britain. We also know that it exists, it, it, there exists the kingdom of Japan, the kingdom of Kuwait, the kingdom of Oman, the kingdom of Swaziland, and there are other so many. And according to the Washington Post of July 2013, there were still 25 monar monarchies or kingdoms in the world. In 2013, the Washington Post surveyed and found that we still have 25 kingdoms in this world today, in the 21st centuries. And these kingdoms are countries because they have representation at the United Nations. They have presidents. Many of them, they still have kings. So if in the 21st century we have kings that are uh, kingdoms and kings that are president and the country representative of countries, so why does he say, or do the Banyarwanda think, that the kingdom that existed before the colonial time were not states or were not countries? And you and me, we know that they were countries. So this assumption that because the kingdom were not countries, so they could not just came, come in inside the kingdom, somebody's kingdom, and then settle, and then they, be, they do whatever they want. It is not true. Africa that did not function that way. America did not function that way. When the, the forefather came in this country, the United States, they found kingdoms. They found the Indian American that we call today. And those nations, they call them nations, so they existed. In Canada, the same thing. So that first assumption is not true. And the second assumption, say, he said that the Banyamlenge that sided with the government. But let us agree with him that the Banya Rwanda sided with him because in 1964 or 1960, there was no Banya, Banya Mulenge. The only people that are, 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 are known to have existed in this part of the world were called the Banya Rwanda or the National Rwanda Rundi. We see it in the document that uh, related to the round table of uh, January, February 1960. We saw it in the La Loi Fondamentale. We saw it in the, the law relative to the election that took place in 1959. And we saw it into uh, the constitution of uh, 1964. We saw it also in, in the decree law that Mobutu signed in uh, 1971 and 1972. They all speak about the Banya Rwanda. They don't talk about Mulengi. Mulengi does not exist at this time. So that means even today, if uh, Dr. Kaniki says that the Banya Mulenge sided, he means the Banya Rwanda sided, because this title does not exist. And so the people that are called Banya Mulenge do not exist. The people that exist are called Banya Rwanda of Rwanda descent, or maybe the Congolese of Banya Rwanda descent, or Banya Rwanda Congolese. The, the, there's nothing wrong about that. So don't be mistaken here. But he said the Banya Rwanda sided with the government. But let us ask a question here. When did they 
sided with the government. Was it in 1961? Was it 1962? Was it 1963? 64? 65? Which year did the Banya Rwanda sided with the government? Because if the, the Congolese were discontent with the affairs of the government, and we know which era we are in here in 1960 to 1964, because the rebellion started in 1964, but the cause preceding the insurgency, insurgency that was created or uh, created or the revolt that was created or the resistance that was created by Pierre Moulele in the province of Quilu, that is in the west uh, part of the country, it didn't just happen overnight. There were some reasons. The rebellion started in 1964, but the cause that caused it started in July 1960. And that's where we have to go. So when the Banyarwanda say that they sided with the government, we have to remember in 1960 here they are living, 1960 to 1964, they are living with the Bafulero, the Bavira, in their territory. They are living in the territory of, of, uh, of Uvira or in the kingdom of Bavira, in the kingdom of uh, Bafuliru. They are living in the kingdom of Babembe, in the kingdom of uh, Barega, in the east, not in the west. At this time, there is no rebellion yet. The rebellion started in 1964. So when he says they sided with the government, when did they start siding with the government? He did not tell you that. But will tell you when did they side with the government and why did they side with the government. He also said that and the other tribe sided with the Mulele. So when he says the other tribe, he is implying that them also they are a tribe. Now we have to make a difference here. If they are a tribe, that means is the tribe of Banyarwanda, not the tribe of Batusi. Because to our knowledge, to this day, the Batusi, uh, Hutu, are, it is not a race. It is not a, a, a tribe. The Banyarwanda are. So if the Banyarwanda at that time sided with the government, we can agree there that the Banyarwanda sided with the government, but we're going to find out when did they sided with the government. And the other tribe sided with the, by the, the rebels. But we have to understand that both are indigenous people. They are all native people. Whether you are Muvira, Mufulero, Mubembe, Mushi, or Murega, Muyindu, at this time of the independence, the nation of Rwanda, they are also natives. And so, when they start siding, they have to have a reason to side because they are all receiving the effect of the independence. And we are living in the era of Cold War, where the, the communist and Marxist are fighting with the Western and the capitalism or imperialist. The United States and France and Britain and Belgium, they are fighting, they, they are fighting over the control of this rich mineral country, the Congo. They don't want the new government to be part of the communists or the Marxists or the Russia or China. And they will see it in the next video. And the State Department have documents that are explaining how the CIA representative or chief of station that was at that time in 1960 in Congo was fighting to make sure that Lumumba and the other uh, cabinet minister do not shift toward the communist or Marxist or Chinese or Russia. So we go to that part when we get into uh, part B, maybe of this uh, uh, video 21. Now, Dr. Kaniki continues. He says, number three, he talked about civil unrest and they were split between neighboring tribes. Civil unrest. So, if he talked about civil unrest, we know that he's not talking about civil unrest between 1964 and 1968. The civil unrest must have happened before 1964. 
but he did not tell us in that video on that particular day beside the pastor Siddiq and the, 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 the other associate he did not tell us what was those civil arrests but we're going to help you to understand so that we, when we, we, we talk about the rebellion we understand what is the rebellion here who was the Pierre Mulele and when did it start and what caused the rebellion to happen and if at which point the Banyarwanda and the Bafulero start fighting themselves, as he claimed. But we know that uh, the Banyarwanda and the Bafulero, Bavira, Babeme, Barega, they were all rebels. And they were all fighting the government, La Arme Nacional Congolese. They were all fighting that, uh, uh, that army because they had a plan and they will reveal that plan. And so we're going to reveal those civil unrest. On July 1960, the situation deteriorated a little more each day. In Matadi, on the Atlantic coast, Belgian parachutes were deployed to protect their compatriots from the Congolese army who were fighting with heavy weapons. On the 13th of July, Lumumba announces the rupture of diplomatic relations with the Belgians and the treaty to call for Soviet, Soviet intervention if the Westerners do not move. On the 17th of July, 1960, a first contingent of UN peacekeeping landed at uh, Njili Airport, led by British General Alexander. That's the first um, uh, 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 incident of the unrest that Dr. Kaniki is talking about. According to Francois Soudan in his article of January 2021 titled DRC, How the CIA Got Patrice Lumumba, he wrote on 26 August 1960, Larry Delphine, the CIA post in Leopoldville, he hired some agitators for that purpose, for that occasion. He had a budget of one hundred thousand dollars a considerable sum of at the time the cia station chief organized an anti lumumba the demonstration that often degenerated into violence on the 5th of september kasahubu dismissed lumumba and replaced him with joseph ileo however the nationalist leader fights back refused to leave his post and wins parliamentary backing the constitutional path seemed blocked. The CIA believes the time has come to get down to business. They could attack. As Sudan, as Sudan here uh, continues with his story, we learn that Lumumba is arrested on September 14, 1960 in Kasai province while trying to escape to Kisangani. He is returned to the Taisville military camp which is today Banzangugu, Banzangugu in the Congo Central Province in the district of Cataract. Meanwhile, Lumumba companion, namely Pierre Mulele, Antoine Gizenga, Aset Kashamura and others, organized a mutiny at, the, at this military camp on January 13, 1961. And this is again arrested, and he is again arrested, I mean, uh, Patrice Lumumba here is again arrested by Mobutu e Bomboko and he is taken on January 17, 1961 to Lumumbashi where Chombe, his enemy, was waiting for him. He then is killed the same year, the same day, January 17, 1961. So that's the second arrest. Here we still before 1964. In another story by the U.S. State Department under the Office of the Historian titled The Congo, the Colonization and Civil War, 1960-1965, we read, On July 5th, Congolese soldiers in the First Public meeting against their white Belgian commanders at the Tassville military base, seeking higher pay as well as greater opportunity and authority. The mutiny quickly spread to other bases and violences soon broke out of across the country. 
thousands of European, primarily Belgium, fled, and stories of atrocities against white surfaced in newspapers around the globe. Unable to control the indigenous army, renamed here the Congolese National Army, the Belgium brought in troop, troops to restore order without seeking permission to do so from either Kasavubu or Lumumba. In response, the Congolese government appealed direct, directly to the United Nations to provide troops and demanded the removal of Belgium troops. On July 13, the United Nations approved a resolution which authorized the creation of an intervention force, the Organization, Organization des Nations Unies au Congo, ONIC, and called for the withdrawal of all Belgium troops. Two days earlier, the wealthy Katanga province has declared its, its independence from the Republic of the Congo, followed in August by South Kasai province. So we have a, a third incident of unrest, the one that uh, Kaniki is talking about. So here, we don't think that they already sided with the government. Because we have to go back and then see what prompted people or the Congolese people to, 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 to revolt or to, to uh, uh, assist or to support Mulele before the Banyarwanda can claim that they sided with the government. But we have to explain what happened before that. On August 4th, 1964, Stanleyville, which is Kisangani in the, in the northeast, fell to rebel forces called by now Simba. Now, if you read another article in New York Times of the same day Lumumba was killed on January 17, 1964, we read that Pierre Mulele, on his return in the country, because he was ambassador to Cairo, and so now he's in 1964. Now he returned. Upon his arrival in Kikwit, the capital of the province of Kiwi, Kwilu, he organized an insurgency from his two tribal men, the Bapende and Babunda, tribe on in January 16, 1964. Mulele and others are not the product of a dream, but the conflict between the communist and socialist and the capitalist. All were exploring, exploiting the new independent Congo, and those who paid the price are not only the Congolese, but also the UN Secretary, Mr. Uh, Dayal Debeg Dag Hammarskjöld. This is the UN Secretary who was killed in 1961-64. So we have to remember that Mulere returned after Lumumba was killed, and Antoine Gizenga is still in prison here for two years. Now, he comes back home in summer of 1963, and here in January 1964, he joined his follower in the training camps in Kikwit, and here is the origin of the Mulele Rebellion. So we have here how those unrest were unfolding. And here, the rebellion has not started yet in in the South Kivu. We are already in uh, January 1964. So we can see from January, from July 1960 to this time, January 64, the rebellion has not reached yet South Kivu. And before even the proclamation of the constitution of 1964, Stanleyville, which is Kisangani, fell under the leadership of um, um, who was this one? Antoine Gisenga. But what we are trying to say here is between 1960 to 1964, the beginning of 1964, there were no rebellion yet in the eastern part of the country, at least in the south part of the country. And so here, the Banyarwanda has not yet sided with the, the government. And Mobutu has not yet taken the country under his control. So he's not yet the president, but he's still the commander of the army. And then we know that uh, the rebellion were uh, uh, failed 
or he, the rebellion fell in 1965. So we're going to end up here for tonight just to give you a, an introduction of how this unrest that Dr. Kaniki presented on that video to give you an idea that the rebellion that took place in Congo Democratic was between them and indigenous people. And these are the unrest that took place between July 1960 to January 1964 to August 4th, 1964, when the city of Kisangani or Stanleyville fell under the rebel. But it is slowly that now Kabila, uh, uh, Kabila will come in play and other re uh, rebe uh, rebellion leader will come in play and then the Banyarwanda will also come in play and we will show you how between 60 and 64, the Banyarwanda now, something is happening in Rwanda. Because we have the revolution, revolution of 1959, we have the uh, election that takes place. Many Banyarwanda and mostly Tusi flee the country. They, they are coming to Congo. And we have the independence that takes place in 1962. And many Banyarwanda Tusi are fleeing the Congo because they are, purchased, they, are, they are chased by the Bahutu and they run to Congo. And we have what they call the mass massacre of 1963. In Rwanda, many Banyarwanda rebels that were outside, they came to attack the new government in, in, in Rwanda, and they are, they are also running away and they return to Congo. And that's when they start now working with the rebels in Congo to fight alongside the Lumumbist or alongside Kabila and the Pierre Mulele and Gizenga and the others, so that when they take power in Congo, now the government of Congo will go and help them and take power back in Rwanda. That's the story, but we're going to develop that in the next video, and we hope that uh, this introduction here is giving you an idea, so that you who are listening, you know exactly how you can analyze when somebody says that uh, the rebellion that took place between 19, uh, 1964 and 1968 was caused by the conflict between the Banyarwanda and the indigenous people, namely here the Bavira, Bafulero, the Babembe, the Bashi, and the Barenga. And that is not helping us if we cannot take time to analyze, to see if what they are telling us is true or is false. So stay tuned, and I hope to see you next time when we develop video uh, part 21B. So today we did part 1A, uh, uh, 21A, and we explain only the part that uh, Kaniki explained what happened before they sided with the government. Next time we we'll speak about who else we can call, uh, understand as a witness, and what does he say also about the rebellion. Then we explain what took place, what role the Banyarwanda play in the rebellion, why they were defeated, and why they sided with the government. Thank you. See you next time. Don't forget to uh, read the description and uh, make a comment and share so that we can have a broad understanding of how Muleng speaks. Thank you. See you next time.